well-known bread commercial. Here in the Grosvenor Hotel, I'm going to look at the work of a one-time Newcastle-upon-Tyne blacksmith's son, Gerard Robinson, a master carver in wood, who during the years 1857 to 1863 carved out of solid oak a most outstanding example of Victorian taste. Now in the residence lounge, the famous Chevy Chase sideboard. A massive piece of furniture, 12 feet wide, 10 feet high, four and a half feet deep, representing in six panels the tragic story of the ballad of Chevy Chase. An old law of the border country provided the English and Scots would never hunt in each other's territory without first obtaining permission. Harry Hotspur, son and heir of the Earl of Northumberland, decided to break this law, challenging the authority of his rival, the Earl of Douglas, by hunting his land and woods. Hunting began at dawn on a Monday. Hotspur, with his hounds and 1,500 men, hunted and harried, chased and killed all through that morning. And by noon, a hundred fat hearts had been slain. Hotspur and his men rest from their efforts, and Hotspur finds himself confronted by the mounted Douglas, demanding explanations concerning the slaughtering of deer on his territory. Hotspur, hand on sword, rejects his interrogation, and scene is set for bloody confrontation. Battle began at midday and was not half done when Evensong Bell was rung. Of Hotspur's 1,500, 53 survived. Douglas's 2,000, 55 both Hotspur and Douglas slain. The mourners began to arrive on the battlefield, seeking their loved ones, weeping and covering their faces with their cloaks, whilst the priests gave comfort and absolution to the dying. The retainers and servants of the families gather up the dead and carry them back to the Percy and Douglas castle to lie in state and await burial. In these six panels carved in oak, Robinson totally captures the atmosphere of border conflict, the magnificent hunting scenes, the anger of Douglas, and the destruction and fury of battle. It is a masterpiece of the woodcarver's art and craft, if not necessarily aesthetically pleasing as a piece of furniture. Abbey Walk. The remains of Shaftesbury's famous abbey lie alongside, founded in 880 by Alfred the Great as a Benedictine community for women with his daughter, its first abbess. Here, the memorial altar to King Edward the Boy Martyr, murdered by the orders of his stepmother at Corfe Castle in 978, brought here for burial a year later. I have to journey on once again, down into the district of St. James, once the source of the town's water supply, which in my opinion is just as well, since the old two brewers in seem to be very firmly closed. The new open all day licensing law seems to have had the opposite effect to me. They're never open. And I can't hang about here all day waiting. 
I've got to move on into open countryside. Eventually out of the town, in the direction of Child Oak Tree, which is my next destination. Child Oakford Memorial Cross stands in the center of the village between the inn and the church. And I wander around Child Oakford, sensing its air of prosperity. The houses are well maintained with smart kept gardens in full bloom. And it's pleasant to stroll its lanes. From here, it's my intention to walk to Hambledon Hill and climb to its summit to visit the Iron Age Fort. First, however, I have to walk past the village church of St. Nicholas and carry on into and through the churchyard, climbing over the church wall using the stone steps set into the brickwork for this purpose, over a new-made wooden stile, and finally, I'm walking fields at the base of Hambledon Hill. This hill fort location during 1645 was the site of a skirmish between 2,000 unarmed farmers, laborers and villagers carrying only sticks who, exasperated by years of the parliamentary army stealing their crops and livestock without payment, banded together and occupied this summit. Cromwell sent 50 crack dragoons, well-armed, equipped and mounted, to deal with them. The result, Cromwell wrote, being no great slaughter, some small execution, I believe killed not 12 of them, but cut very many. the bank of the River Stour at Shillingstone between Child Oakford and Blandford. I'm making my way to Beer Marsh Farm where the farmer's wife, Fiona Ida, has opened a farm shop that specializes in Italian farm products which she makes from the milk from her husband Gianni's dairy herd. She makes pasta, there's cheese and delicious ice cream. been made today, that's that strawberry, yes, that hasn't it? Yes, it was made it with fresh local English strawberries. Which we're all soaking in there when I arrived yes, at yes. So let me try yes, some yes. of that, Fiona. Yeah. Because I had your chocolate and that was glorious. Well, and do you reckon that's better? No, it's completely different. It's, uh, this is a nice fresh tasting ice cream, which is more like a sorbet. And it has no milk in, so it's refreshing. There's no milk at all? No. How do you make it? Then? So it, we use fresh English strawberries, which we get from the fruit farms, which are local. And we put in water and sugar, and that's all nothing else. Oh, that is lovely. That really is lovely. It is like strawberry. It is just like eating a strawberry. Well, it's lovely on a hot, sunny day. We've got all these beautiful ice creams here. Why is it that Italian ice cream is so much better than any product of our own? Well, I don't think it's any different. I think... Oh, I think it is. Well, I think that English ice cream is, is very nice, but it's much richer. It has, it's made with double cream and ours is made with just milk with a touch of cream in. So actually you can eat more of it. And there's a lovely creamy taste to it as well. I'm not going to ask you what gained you the idea of, of opening an Italian product, farm shop, because your, your husband, Gianni, right. is Italian. You went to live in Italy. Italy. Italy yeah. 
And then you came back to what was virtually the family farm. That's right, anyway. yes. And now my husband runs it. And um, he occupies himself with the cows and the milking and everything. And brings me the milk from the farm. And then I turn it all into ice cream. But it was a very bold venture, wasn't it? Because normally farm shop people come for eggs and they come for fresh milk and butter. But they don't come for Italian product. Well, I think we're very lucky because we have quite a good area with a lot of second homes around here. We have a lot of people who come down for the weekend and a lot of wealthy people and a lot of people who appreciate good, good food. And most people now, after watching television programmes, know about Italian cooking. And the pasta is also made here? Yes, that's right. Yes, we use Italian uh, semolina flour and eggs and we make it in a pasta machine and it's made fresh for each weekend. And as far as I can see sitting here most of the day working, the cars stream in and out non-stop. They do, luckily. I have a confession to make. When I left the farm shop, I was weighed down with delicious Italian farm produce. I loved Italian food, particularly pasta. I never thought I'd be purchasing it in the heart of the Dorset countryside. I don't imagine these Frisians care what's made from their milk, providing they continue living in this rural paradise. 